Great. Thanks, Jacob. Hi, everybody. Um, like Jacob said, I'm Leah Zemesnik. I'm based in Missoula, Montana, um, and I work for the National Forest Foundation, which is the congressionally chartered partnership group for the U.S. Forest Service. Um, I am the partnership coordinator there, and in my role, I work with the D.C. Office of the Forest Service um, to build partnership strategy plans on forests across the country. Um, so my job is um, it. It's a lot of social science. It involves going to different forests across the country, um, interviewing Forest Service staff members and their partners to understand what's going well for them, what's not going so well for them, um, and what we can build on to build up a better partnership strategy at the local units. Um, I've been with NFF for about two years now um, and got here kind of through a a roundabout way that actually started as working um, as a wilderness research for the Society of Wilderness Stewardship, um, which was a really great starting point for me. Um, I come from a background of doing trail work, conservation corps, working in fire. Um, I had done that for a couple of years and then realized I kind of wanted to focus more on the people aspect of conservation. Um, I've done a little bit of that in the past and that's what I really enjoyed doing. Um, so I went to grad school at Colorado State University um, and got my degree in human dimensions of natural resources. Um, my thesis work focused on building a co-management plan um, in New Zealand between some of the indigenous people and the federal government over there. Um, so working with them to understand how they can work together to manage um, a really culturally significant national park. Um, and then while I was in New Zealand, I interviewed with Heather for the Society of Wilderness Stewardship research job. Um, and that brought me to Jackson, Wyoming, um, where I worked there for a little while and just kind of serendipitously then got involved with the Wyoming Wilderness Association. Um, and I was a community organizer for them working on forest planner vision and trying to get some permanent wilderness designations for, for some wilderness study areas up there. Um, that then led me down kind of a policy realm um, and I became a policy manager for a local community-based organization in Jackson, the Jackson Hole Conservation Alliance. Um, that I worked on housing, wildlife protection, wilderness designation, kind of the full gamut. Um, but during that time, I really realized I missed kind of working a little bit closely with the federal government. Um, and so that led me to work for the National Forest Foundation, um, which brought me to Missoula. Um, so that is kind of the path I've taken to get here. Um, I think I really early on in my career kind of figured out that I wanted to work with people and that was where I wanted to focus my work. Um, as much as I loved digging trail and doing all of those things, um, I really missed the people aspect. Um, and so I kind of started really looking at jobs that I wanted in the future versus where I was at in the moment and looking at what skills I needed to develop to get those jobs down the line. Um, and a lot of those skills were honed on facilitation, collaboration, um, and kind of more what people call the soft skills. Um, so just kind of doing things that could lead me down that line of sometimes that meant taking on projects that were a little bit out of the scope of my work of my normal job, but that led me to get um, more of the skills that I needed to develop and really focus and hone in, um, especially on the social science research skills. Um, yeah, I think I think that's all I have, Jacob, unless there's anything else you would like me to elaborate on. That's great. Thank you, Leah. Yeah. Um, and just a reminder for all of our participants, if you'd like to switch to speaker view, which uh, brings up the um, speaker's face um, larger, you could go to the top right of the Zoom platform and there's a little box that says view. Um, and it might be a little bit helpful um, to get a more of a presentation feel. Thank you, Leah. Um, so now I'm going to hand it over to Teresa Martinez. Um, Teresa is the executive director uh, for the Continental Divide Trail Coalition. Uh, thanks, Teresa. Thanks, Jacob. Hi, everyone. And I'm going to share my screen and hopefully I'm going to do this right because it's, you know, um, so hopefully I'm going to mute and hopefully it won't back. Let's see. We'll see. Can you all see that? Thumbs up, thumbs down. Can you see my screen? 
Yep, it looks good. And it's it showing the, the PowerPoint presentation part? Okay, great. All right, so hi everyone. Um, as Jacob said, I'm Teresa Martinez. I'm the Executive Director of the Continental Divide Trout Coalition. I'm actually based in Santa Fe, New Mexico. And um, these are the homelands of the Hickory Apache and um, Tiwa people. And I'm, I'm on stolen and unceded lands as we all are these days, as we acknowledge that. Um, I want to always start these kinds of conversations and talking about who I am and where I come from, because I think it's important in all of the work that we do to understand us as humans. Um, like Leah, I actually have a, a strong conservation background, but I did human dimensions and natural resources as a master's degree, which I'll get to in a second. But it really, I think we lose sometimes the human part of the work that we do. So I always start with where I come from. This is my mom and dad who are no longer on this planet. Um, my mom, Condelaria, my dad, Alex. My dad was a lettuce picker in Galveston, sitting in Brownsville, Texas on a farm. And my mom was a migrant farm worker up the Ohio Valley. They met in Austin, Texas, when he was at the University of Texas putting himself through college. And she was in a technical school learning how to type and working in a dentist office. And uh, they met. Um, he went to Vietnam for three years, came back. They got married. And then he ended up becoming a public servant in the State Department working for his entire career, which is then when my brother came along. And then I was born in, this, in uh, 1969. So if you're doing the math fast, I'm 51. And I uh, was born actually in the Dominican Republic when my parents were stationed there um, in 1969. And, uh, and then we moved all over the world and always came back to Northern Virginia where my dad's main post was um, at working out of the Vienna office. and downtown DC and um, I had an incredible life but my life was very unique in that we traveled all over the world um, and I think that was really awesome to grow up in that space but I think as soon as I turned 18 I wanted to settle down and so I ended up going to Virginia Tech uh, and um, many of you may know that if, let's see will it let's see is it going there it is um, so I went to Virginia Tech. Um, this is um, Burris Hall, and I did my undergrad there. And my first weekend at Virginia Tech, I was invited, or I saw um, a poster to do volunteer work on the Appalachian Trail, and I had no idea what the Appalachian Trail was. I grew up all over the world, saw all sorts of things, had no idea there was this trail that spanned the East Coast from Georgia to Maine. And um, so that weekend, I went out on the AT, and they handed me a pair of loppers, and we did a 10-mile hike, and maintain a section of the AT that the Outing Club of Virginia Tech maintained, which is one of two clubs that maintain segments of the AT. And that first hour, I was like, what's this white blaze again? And the trail supervisor sort of said, well, if you go left, you end up in Georgia, and if you go right, you end up in Maine. And my mind was just blown that something like that existed, that you could walk basically the length of the North American continent, and you could do it for free, and that not only could I do it for free, but I could do it with service. I could actually do it with a tool in my hand and that it was encouraged. And I just fell in love in that moment. I fell in love with the idea of service. I fell in love with that I was a young brown woman doing something on behalf of other people. And it was just so foreign to me. And it was nature and it was a community at which, of which growing up all over the world, you never really kind of have a home. And I immediately found a home. And that led me to working on the summer, every summer between college, which I was already in a wildlife program. I was building sections of the AT with the Conorock Trail Crew. This is lugging concrete through the woods up near the Browns Creek Shelter in, Northern, in Central Virginia. And then this is me working a rock drill back in the days when they let volunteers blow up rocks um, on the Lover's Leap relocation down in uh, the French Broad River on North Car in North Carolina. I don't know if Andy Downs is on the phone yet, but he's very familiar with this segment. Um, and Andy Downs now has my old region at the AT, which I'll talk about here in a second. And so that led me to actually getting to work with the Appalachian Trail Conservancy at the time conference. Um, I was one of the first assistant regional reps. Um, I actually went to work there first, actually, in 1991 to 1995. And then I went and did grad school at Virginia Tech and did my degree in human dimensions and natural resources, looking at volunteerism and why people volunteer and why they don't, why they quit why they, they drop out, um, and then got lucky enough to come back to work at ATC in 90, 1999 through 2001. I was in the same old position, and you'll notice that I'm like one, of brown, one brown person in a sea of white. I used to joke about being the cultural mecca at ATC, um, and I, <laughs> in 2001, I was elevated to the regional director role in my region, which was Southwest and Central Virginia, which is everything from Shenandoah National Park South to the Virginia-Tennessee line. And then I had primary responsibility 
of managing their Southern trail crews. And then in 2006, when ATC went through its sort of transition from conference to conservancy, I became a trail-wide program manager and really started focusing my efforts on trail-wide consistent approaches mm -hmm. to management and in particular looking at accessibility and creating opportunities for persons with disabilities to actually access segments of, this, of the AT, which was really powerful. And it was a really great way to expand my knowledge. Um, and then in 2007, um, right before the shootings at Virginia Tech, actually, because I still lived in Blacksburg, I ended up uh, getting a chance to go work for the Continental Divide Trail Alliance. And I moved everything. I had a junkyard dog and myself, and we moved across the country and moved to Pine, Colorado, and began working for the Continental Divide Trail Alliance, which was the best experience in my life. At, at the AT, I used to say I was kind of putting candles in a cake that was already baked. And at CDTA, we were sort of in the kitchen trying to figure out if we were building a cake or a batter bread or cupcakes. We didn't know. Um, and at the end of the day, um, CDTA, unfortunately, and I had um, increasing roles of responsibility, but in 2012, the organization closed its doors, unfortunately, and just a uh, casualty of nonprofit management, honestly. And, um, and so there we were, myself and a staff of 12, and we didn't know what to do. So we decided we'd build our own nonprofit. And so the first couple of years, we, uh, in 2000, uh, June of 2012, myself and three other folks decided to form the Continental Divide Trail Coalition. And I can tell you my lifetime of career, one, I never thought I'd be on, a, on unemployment, especially with a master's degree. And two, I never thought I'd be sitting at my dining room table building a new nonprofit um, and working three jobs to do that. <laughs> so this was, we used to call this the war room um, or the headquarters, world headquarters of CDTC. This is what it looked like for the first two years of an organization building it literally off the ground with literally dollars. We started with $4, um, pretty much the four of us who co-founded the organization put a dollar in each and then we started slowly bumping out. We actually did a crowdfunding campaign to gain funding and do sort of approach nonprofit management with a different lens and also looking at the CDT with a different lens as well and trying to build a collective community that was grassroots based that really created a strong foundation for the future of the organization versus trying to be reliant on one type of funding which was CDTA's problem focusing solely on federal funding. So that started us in 2012 you know, we were the cultural, we were the, um, not cultural mecca, we were the brain trust of, of the information around the CDT. And so um, we, uh, you know, we did all the things. We met with the chief of the Forest Service. We met with our senators. We um, worked with partners like, you know, Colorado's for, um, well, she's after Colorado, Colorado Trail Foundation, and slowly began to really understand the role we played. And for us, what was really important in Paramount was building collaborative partnerships in everything we do. So whether it was going up and looking at trail segments like myself in, in this picture, I'm walking with our forest service partner, Brenda Biancoviak in Glacier, or working with outdoor retailer partners like Big Agnes, bringing small business owners to meet with Senator Bennett, or working with warriors um, or veterans who were hiking off the effects of uh, PTSD from the effects of war on the CDT. You know, we're always actively looking at how we can engage a broader, different perspective of people into a national scenic trail, congressionally designated national scenic trail, and creating a model of community engagement and partnership. And so for me and my work, where I started out saying, you know, everything we do is human-centered, it really has become about the human and the communities that we serve and how we function is always based on those communities. In about 2015, I was given the opportunity to be a part of um, a unique effort brought to DC. Um, the lower left picture is the first convening of, in my personal career of 30 some years, or at that time, maybe 28 years, the first time I'd ever been in a room full of more people that look like me than white people. Um, traditionally, I would be a part of in a, in a, in a community of professionals. And um, this group included, everybody from some of the freedom fighters to, um, you know, Jose Gonzalez and uh, uh, Carolyn Finney, um, you know, icons in this movement around diversity, equity, and inclusion in the outdoors and natural resources and professionals. And out of this, we grew another new net effort called the Next 100 Coalition, which was an organization, a, a coalition of organizations, individuals, and supporters of people who work with com primarily communities of color or leaders within the community of color space in the natural resources world. And we launched this new coalition of which now there's a national level and I'm actually the chair of the board of the Next 100 Coalition on the national level, but also we have a Colorado contingent 
working really locally on Colorado issues. And this was in 2015, and this has also catapulted CDTC and my personal interest in work and really creating a different lens for conservation and how we did our work along the Continental Divide Trail, what partners we could bring to the table, how we could leverage partnerships. You know, we have this amazing landscape that serves 180 million people in terms of the watershed that it provides, and they're all communities of varying types of diversity, um, economic, cultural, historic, um, racial, all of the above. And it gave us a unique opportunity to start looking at the CDT as a landscape that connects across co communities, cultures, and histories versus a, a trail on a map. And so that's how we focus a lot of the work. That's, a, that's where I spend a lot of my time nowadays is rethinking, reimagining, and re, um, reassessing how we do conservation work in this world in this day. And um, for me, you know, I still love doing the on the ground trail work. Like you put a tool in my hand, it's a little harder these days, I'm a little older, but I still love it. But I also love building in those great gateway communities and working and thinking and rethinking how we do this work. And for me professionally, you know, for so much of my career, I think I felt this really dis, dis ease where I felt I was too brown to be white and too white to be brown. And now I'm finding a way of bringing um, my personal story and my connection to my history and who, who I represent as well as where I work and how we can do this work together. And really, for me, it's about a focus on partnerships, really looking at that equity space, creating a different kind of board for an organization that is sustainable well into the future, a new future, a dynamic future that we haven't even quite to understand yet, um, that we're working in an innovative, collaborative, and creative space, personally, and that we're centering on the human, we're centering on the future, and we're centering on the word and. It's not a but or instead of, it's how do we do all of this looking forward knowing what we know today. And so for me, I'm happy to be here with that lens of just understanding where I come from, what I've experienced in my career, and how I see the future, which can be a really um, innovative, creative space for all of us to think about how we can do conservation stewardship different. So with that, I'll stop sharing and thank you. Thank you very much, Teresa. Um, up next, we have Matt Kirby, who's the Director, Energy and Landscape Conservation Program, um, National, sorry, I misspoke there, but he, <laughs> the Director of the Energy and Landscape Conservation Program for the National Parks Conservation Association. Thanks, Matt. Yeah. Thanks, Jacob. I'm happy to be here with you all today. Appreciate it. Yeah, again, I'm Matt, um, based in Denver, Colorado. Um, work with NPCA, um, which is less of a mouthful, I guess, the National Parks Conservation Association, um, where I run our program that focuses on the lands outside of park boundaries um, and managing how managing those lands um, affects park resources. And so how do we advocate then for management plans outside of park boundaries that affect park resources inside park boundaries? Um, but I began my career journey in like 2007 exactly 2007, I guess, um, like so many people do, just applying for a whole lot of stuff. Once I graduated from undergrad, um, I was an English major, environmental studies minor, didn't know what I was going to do, um, followed my partner to D.C., who would later become my wife, and sort of just ended up at a, a communications job at the Environmental Protection Agency at the time, since I was an English major, so I assumed the only thing I could do was communications. Um, you know, this was the last year of the Bush administration, though, and I was sort of in our Office of Research and Development that was giving grants to researchers, and I was, like, writing little things online about them. Um, and it was the last year of eight years' budget cuts, and so it was a it was, it was not a, a happy work environment, let's just say. And I, I remember after about nine months, my my boss took me aside and she was like, Matt, if you want to make change, don't stay in the agency, um, which was pretty, pretty, um, it, it woke me up a little bit and sort of pushed me in this more advocacy direction. Um, so looking around D.C. at the time when you're a 23-year-old in D.C., um, there's lots of internships, fellowships, whatnot. So that's what I started exploring. I, I sort of went through the roster of big green groups, big environmental groups, um, and landed myself an uh, apprenticeship program, it was called at the time, at the Sierra Club. Um, so I was on our little team in D.C. that worked on land, water, and wildlife protections. Um, and what I also very quickly learned, that th that's sort of what I grew up with in college, right, reading about the Sierra Club and um, all the great victories they'd had protecting lands, protecting parks, um, and realized that that was actually a really small part of what the conservation movement had grown to do. 
Um, and a lot of the, the big donor money, the big foundation money at the time was in climate. There was a big climate bill happening in DC at the time. Um, there was a, a burgeoning effort to shut down coal campaign, uh, coal plants, which began the Beyond Coal campaign. Um, and so we were sort of this like little team and we used to joke that we were the Sierra Club arm of the Sierra Club, right? Doing the work that we all thought Sierra Club did, but was actually a pretty small part of the portfolio. So um, after that apprenticeship, I actually stayed on and was offered the position of a junior lobbyist on their team, which um, I decided to take and became a bit of a generalist. So I worked on forest issues. I worked on um, endangered species and wilderness designations, which is how I um, came to first be introduced to the Society for Wilderness Stewardship. But if you'd asked me at the time, do, do you want to be a lobbyist? Is that what you're going to do? I would have said absolutely not. That was everything that I, I don't view about myself. I, I'm, I'm an introvert. I don't do small talk well. It seems like a lot of socializing. Um, and it pushed me way beyond my comfort zone. But I learned that, that I was good at it, and it gave me a lot of skills. You know, I learned how to make these, like, succinct arguments, learned how to work a room, learned how to network. Um, D.C. is, in many ways, it's everything that I'm not, but it's, it's a great place to learn a lot of skills that can turn out to be important in a, in a competitive workspace and a work environment. But I eventually decided that D.C. was not the lifestyle um, I wanted to, to live permanently. And um, my wife grew, out, he grew up out here in Colorado, so we sort of began plotting our, our Colorado move. Um, so for me, internally, that meant making a shift from what I had been doing, sort of running legislative campaigns, over into running sort of broader campaigns. So I moved into our, our silo that was like, we called it our campaign structure, but where we, we looked at federal policy, we looked at communications, we looked at our legal team, we looked at our field team and thought, how do you put all these pieces together? Um, so in about 2013, I began running the Monuments Campaign, the National Monuments Campaign for Sierra Club under Obama. Um, and that was sort of my ticket out of D.C. because I did not need to be tied to D.C. for that job. Um, so I took that job to Denver and uh, ran that campaign with them for three years um, the final three years of the administration, where obviously we had some, some huge national monument victories um, under Obama, which which was great. Um, but then after Trump won, um, I, I knew I needed a little bit of a, a change, and new protective designations were not where we were going to have victories over the next four years, um, and we were going to be doing a lot of defense. So I went to a group called the Western Energy Project, um, which is sort of like a, a fake little front, front group for some big foundations where they pool resources to, to fight oil and gas. Um, at the time, that, that's what they were doing. So um, I was the campaign director there, looking sort of across the, um, the conservation community and trying to, we would kind of try to strategically fill gaps, specifically around oil and gas fights, to try to bring voices to the table um, or bring entities to the table who would be instrumental in stopping lease sales. Um, and I worked at that job for a little over two years. Um, which is then how I got hooked up with the National Parks Conservation Association, since I was learning very quickly that in most of the places where we had success under Trump fighting oil and gas lease sales, it was when a, a nearby national park was, was threatened and when that was the message that resonated with the public, right? And so it, it sort of showed me what a powerful um, narrative message the national parks carry, right? And so I then left to come here to MPCA to help them build out this new program, which was how do we use that message? How do we use those parks to leverage public support to protect the landscapes around parks? Um, so it was still a lot of oil and gas fighting for, for two years, but we are in a, a brand new world um, with a lot of exciting potential ahead of us. So uh, just a few sort of, I just wanted a few lessons learned that um, I sort of in my 13 securities years have come to learn. Um, the one thing I would say is, jump at an opportunity, even if it's not what you think you want, right? I think Leah gave great advice saying, if you can plan out where you want to be, um, get those skills. I was never I was never that person who could do that. So if you can do that, great. But, you know, I sort of look back in my 13 years and it's more of a zigzag. Um, and again, I never thought that being a lobbyist would be something I wanted to do, but it was something that when an opportunity came, I took it um, and you sort of see see where it leads you next. Um, the second I would say is that networking is incredibly important. Um, that's why I think it's great that Heather and Jacob have set up sort of structures like these um, to talk and meet other people. Um, just I, I think most things in my life, most of the work I do, continues to be built on relationships I've developed with people over years. 
um, and to, to be able to sort of continue that work, um, to continue being sort of a, a people person, being willing to put yourself out there and build authentic relationships with people, um, I think will continue to, to take you a, a long way. Um, and then the third, I would say, for, for anyone who is young and getting started in your career, um, I know people involved with SWS don't always think of ourselves as DC people, and again, I don't, but I will say it is a great place to start your career. Um, if so many people I know now in the conservation advocacy community did a stint in DC, um, I think it, there's a lot of people who want to live like out here in the West, and there's a fewer number of jobs for all those people who want. But if you go to DC, anything you're passionate about, even if it's not in the environmental space, there is someone there doing that work. And there's an opportunity for you to do that work there and meet a lot of people in a very concentrated space and a lot of really smart, passionate people, and then build those relationships that then can sort of radiate out across the country. Um, so, you know, I never thought I'd be that person, but I always tell whenever I'm talking to someone um, who's early in their job, I'm like, don't rule DC out. There's a lot of jobs there um, and a lot of opportunities. So, um, but that, with that, I will, I will pause and turn it back to Jacob. Great. Thank you, Matt Kirby. Um, and uh, now we'll pass it over to Ann Baker Easley. Um, Ann's the Chief Executive Officer uh, with Volunteers for Outdoor Colorado. Thanks, Ann. I'm going to try to share my screen. Can you see my screen? Yes. Yes. OK. So hi, everyone, and thank you, Jacob um, and um, Heather, for doing this. And um, I'm going to, um, I'm, I'm the oldster on this panel today. And in fact, um, April 30th, I am retiring um, after a 40-year career in nonprofit work. And um, so uh, I'll probably be a little bit more um, focused on the uh, you know, sort of looking back um, and sort of trying to tell you a little bit about the fact that my career path was not completely straight um, or designed, um, but I have a couple of things to share, I hope, uh, with that. I am currently um, completing 14. I entered my 15th year actually here at VOC, so I started at Volunteers for Outdoor Colorado in 2007. Prior to coming to Volunteers for Outdoor Colorado, I was the founding director of the Colorado Youth Corps Association here in the state of Colorado, obviously. Um, and before that had stints with AmeriCorps in Triple C. I was a regional program director for the campus here in Denver. Um, before that, I was a youth corps director in Denver and then a youth corps director in Durham, North Carolina. So a lot of my career has been in youth and youth programming, but um, just to step back a little bit, um, I was born and raised in Boulder, um, Colorado, and so obviously the events of this last week have been very uh, difficult um, for me and our family here in, Dem in, in uh, Boulder, but um, anyway, I grew up in Boulder, um, was um, certainly a part of the outdoors, and um, you know, I actually took my first uh, mountain climbing class with the Colorado Mountain Club and you know when I was in high school and my parents made sure we had survival skills and all these things but I will tell you I was of the four children of my family I was the least inclined to spend any time in the outdoors and in fact I kind of wanted to be like an airline stewardess or uh, you know a fashion designer until my mother said there's no future in that for you and so um, I I too am a Colorado State uh, University graduate um, as an undergraduate. Um, I had a double degree there in social work and psychology. And I was really driven towards the social sciences. Um, I enjoyed those and I enjoyed sociology. Um, but I ended up actually going to Duke Divinity School um, where I was focused on hospital chaplaincy. And after spending time um, in that work, I decided, um, I, I remember going to a career counselor, you know, and I said, quite frankly, you know, just like dealing one-on-one -on -one with people like this, I just like, I can't do it. You know, this whole, whole social work stuff is like, no way and no way can I do this. And after doing a couple of tests and analysis, you know, she said, you know, your skill set seems to really be you know, focused on some of the organizational and program development things. And I went, well, yeah, I guess, maybe. 
So I ended up going to the University of Michigan, getting a graduate degree in social work, um, a master's in social work, but not in clinical work. And you will all thank me for not being in clinical work, but in actually administration policy program development work. And so, you know, a lot of my orientation is around systems and organizations. So a lot of the folks on this panel are like, oh, you know, I love being outdoors. I wanted to really, you know, be in the conservation world. I wanted none of that. But when I look back, you know, I've spent a lot of my career in that, but actually at a very, very different kind of dimension of that kind of work. So I'm just gonna give you like my three little top pointers of what I felt like um, after all these years, being 40 years in this kind of work, what sort of stands has stood out for me in that. So first there's sort of three things. Um, for me, it's been a, a process of really connecting the dots. Um, the second is cultivating relationships. And the third is checking regularly in on emotional intelligence. And I'll, I'll go over that a little bit, but, um, and I thought this coffee hour, so here's some donuts for you. I brought those for you, but, um, so connecting the dots, one of my favorite things um, during this very horrendous pandemic is the New York Times has these free puzzles. I think you can do two a day or something. And so, you know, I take advantage of the free ones. One of them is how do you make these shapes that connect dots? And, um, I'm, you know, I love doing that. And when I look back at my career, I think there are several really important dots that start almost all the time aligning. One is around the whole thing of service. Um, I think the reason I went to divinity school was a passion for the ministry and being involved in connections that way from a spiritual dimension. Um, but the social work and psychology piece were also really big for me, like the human interaction and all of that. So that's a dot. That's a point that almost in every job I've had, I've, I've found my place with that dot. Another dot is kind of the whole organizational development. I really love looking at program development. And that's what I've spent almost all my career in. I have been the founding director of several organizations. So I have started them from the ground, which meant developing boards and developing budgets and developing the programs and hiring the staff and, you know, and um, also scaling organizations. I've spent a lot of my career in scaling up organizations. And so, you know, I think that's another dot that all of a sudden I realized that's a skill set I had, which was sort of this organizational development, program development work. Um, a third dot is really program evaluation, really impact. Um, I spent a lot of my career looking at, does this really matter? If we do this, does it really matter? Even here at Volunteers for Outdoor Colorado, an example of that is that we're a boots on the ground. We involve volunteers on the ground. Um, First of all, that's not my gig. I don't actually like making trails. I don't actually like doing that kind of work. I will spend time out there doing it, but I don't really enjoy it. But how do I find the right people to do that? And then what's the impact of that work? And are there ways that we can tweak or look at our program development a little bit differently? And so that's been a real dot for me is impact and evaluation. And that's been a characteristic of all of my jobs and careers. And the last one is that I've really figured out that my gift or my talent is that actually at this big thinker strategic level. I've done a lot of networking, collaboration building, those kinds of things. And I'm, I enjoy that and, and do well at that. And so that, those are sort of my sort of dots that sort of anchor me. Another thing, and you know, cer certainly Matt right before um, me spoke to this and others on this uh, panel, but really like looking at relationships and cultivating those and being intentional about those. And they're not all driven in my case by, you know, is this gonna get me ahead if I, you know, network with somebody or I go. And in fact, in my organization, they will tell you that if they, if somebody says, would you please go and attend this, you know, reception? I go, oh my God, no, I do not wanna go. But I realize more and more that it's really those connections, it's that personal connection and we see this in all sorts of things, including, you know, all of the work that we're doing to try to diversify and make our society more inclusive. It is really about personal connections that matter, and that matters in work as well. So that was a second point um, as I look back. 
And the third is sort of this whole idea of kind of checking in on emotional intelligence. And I, you know, more and more the work that I do is really around, you know, building organizations. And so who are the people in the organization? How do we sort of strengthen ourselves? And a lot of that work is doing our own work, uh, starting first with ourselves and making sure that we are really able to work well and are sort of doing that level of self-reflection so that we can really work with others to accomplish goals, sort of have the, the, a daily practice of self-reflection. We're always talking about that in our staff meetings here at VLC, kind of understanding and knowing our own moods to know when we're sort of, you know, having a bad day and not really, you know, putting that on somebody else, even our baggage at the door kind of thing. And so, you know, if I look back, I think those are really things that have mattered to me and have made my career successful. And I'm kind of now at a, at a point where instead of calling it re retirement, I'm calling it kind of rewirement. Um, I think I really need to rewire and sort of figure out new ways of doing things. And, um, but all of those things that I've done for the last 40 years, I, I bet you will still be sort of the anchors to what I do going forward. So with that, I just want to thank you and thanks for being here and having this opportunity to talk with you. And um, you're welcome to contact me at this address. And thanks. That's it. See you. Great. Anyway. Thank you, Ann. Um, yes, yeah, so and I will hand it over to Andrew Downs. Andrew is the Senior Regional Director um, for the South Region for the Appalachian Trail Conservancy. Thanks, Andrew. Yeah, hi. Thanks for having me, everybody. And nice to see a bunch of familiar faces here um, on my computer screen. So as Jacob said, uh, my name is Andrew Downs. I work out of Roanoke, Virginia, on about 600 miles of the Appalachian Trail. Um, I'm the Senior Regional Director, which means my responsibilities, other than making sure my staff are well supported and happy, uh, I do federal policy and legislation, I do land protection, external threats, and then donor engagement is, is kind of like, and then the random stuff also that comes up as well um, on a day-to-day -day basis, which it tends to do. So my background, um, I'm originally from Eastern North Carolina, um, but went to Appalachian State University and got a degree in archeology. span I was actually an archeologist for a number of years primarily doing survey. I didn't really like that, didn't really like the work for a number of reasons. I mean, I liked being out in the woods, I liked finding stuff, but as an archeologist, you're generally the, um, the last uh, person in front of the bulldozer. And so you're, you're identifying all sorts of cultural resources, you know, also walking through a bunch of pretty places that are gonna get bulldozed, most more than likely. Um, and so I was, I uh, wanted to get into more of a conservation side of things. Uh, I had through hiked the AT coming out of college and figured that, you know, if I could get a 401k essentially doing archaeology, I could do the same thing protecting the trail that I love. So I went back to uh, school at uh, North Carolina State University and had an internship there. Um, designed a GIS-based internship that was supposed to kind of crosswalk the National Park Service's trails data with the Forest Service's trails data. Um, and I spent about three months of that and then ran away screaming because I was worried that I was going to get turned into a um, computer jockey. And I did not like that. Um, this kind of freaked out the people at NC State because they were ready to pay for my tuition um, and, you know, hadn't had a lot of people turn that down, but um, I, I just wasn't into the work. So I decided to design my own internship at North Carolina State University and worked on North Carolina's Mounts to Sea Trail. So I worked with uh, about seven uh, municipalities along what would become the Mounts to Sea Trail in North Carolina to protect land, to uh, build trails, build um, canoe and kayak accesses um, where the trail was co-located with a blue way or a, or a soon to be blue way uh, and then helped all them um, develop a, a critical mass among their constituencies and then uh, um, access 
state and federal and private dollars to either buy the land that they would put their um, trail and park on or um, build the actual infrastructure. So I did that for a number of years, all with the, the goal essentially of working on the Appalachian Trail. Um, got out of, got out of uh, graduate school. There was an immediately a job open in, um, in Virginia um, in Teresa Martinez's office. I applied for that job. Uh, I did not get a call back, if, as I remember. <laughs> so then there was another job uh, at ATC in the Asheville, North Carolina office. I applied for that job. I had got a call back. I had actually spoke with Teresa. She had told me that I wasn't going to get a call back. I said, what can I do to be better? She gave me a couple pointers. I took those to heart. The next job that came open, I did get a call back in interview. Um, I did not get that job either. Uh, but I, you know, when they told me, I was like, well, you know, what can I do um, to make myself more competitive? And I did those things. And then the third job that I applied for, I got a call back, got an interview, and was offered the job um, in uh, the North Carolina regional office serving Georgia, North Carolina, Tennessee. So in that job, I ran um, the trail crew program, um, Ridge Runners, a number of seasonal programs down there, um, as well as did a variety of, of response to everything from like rabid skunks to um, power line collapse. Um, in 2013, I uh, took a promotion and moved from North Carolina to the Virginia Regional Office uh, to become the Regional Director here, and then was uh, promoted two years ago to Senior Regional Director, now supervising um, folks in Georgia, or excuse me, in Virginia, West Virginia, Maryland, and, and Pennsylvania. Um, I think, you know, if, if I could add just a little bit of a of another perspective, you know, along the lines of what I think is valuable advice that's already been offered. You know, if there's something out there that you feel passionate about or a need that you see, there may not be a job it, it currently in existence that addresses that need or, um, or is structured kind of to serve that purpose that you think um, needs to be served. And so I would say there are opportunities to create your own are there chances to create your own opportunities to create your own jobs and um, and be really responsive to a needs based approach? And so, if you see something out there that that needs to happen, whether it's trail development, whether it's conservation, whether it's engaging new partners or a variety of things, and nobody's doing it, boy, it, that that could be a great opportunity for you to design your entry point to a to a career and the beginning of a career path for yourself. Um, I, I certainly think that there's a lot of opportunities available to do things like that. Um, but really, I mean, I think trust your, trust yourself in a way. And when you look at this landscape of, uh, conservation organizations and recreation based organizations, don't assume that we've currently got everything covered, right? Um, there's a lot of needs out there. And I think a lot of, um, opportunity to build your own job and build your own career. So, um, that's kind of the, the, the tactic I, I took it at some points and it served me well, it's definitely not the only way to do things. But, um, but uh, like I said, I, I think that um, there's a lot of things out there we need that we're not doing. And so being responsive to that, I think, and trusting your gut is, is a good way to go. Um, I've been with the Appalachian Trail Conservancy now for um, 14 years. I also serve as board chair of the National Wilderness Stewardship Alliance. And, and I see many of my, my co-board members and, and partners, hey Ann, um, out there. Um, I worked on the, I think the first Wilderness Skills Institute, which was held in the Southeast in 2010. Um, and just, you know, working on the Appalachian Trail, much like a lot of these other organizations, you get a lot of experience doing just the random stuff that comes up either in the threat matrix or as a variety of opportunities to both improve the, um, the resource and improve the resources ability to support and be valuable to the public. So I've got a lot of variety of experience um, doing all sorts of weird stuff really uh, under the umbrella of ATC's work. And happy to share that with you as needed. That's me. Great, thank you very much, Andrew. No problem.
And now we have Mike Splain, um, the executive director with the Ventana Wilderness Alliance. Thanks, Mike. Okay, yeah, thank you, Jacob. I'm gonna share um, my screen here. And uh, can everybody see that okay? Yeah. Yeah, okay. Um, so I guess um, I'm, the, I'm the underachiever late bloomer of the group, um, but I'll start off by saying that uh, I'm speaking to you from the uh, traditional unceded lands of the Amamutsun tribe. Um, the lands that we happen to work on as the Ventana Wilderness Alliance are the unceded traditional lands of the Eswin and Salina tribes. Um, so I'll tell you about our work here in the Forest Service designation is the Monterey Ranger District of Los Padres National Forest. It's a really an island of wild country and a sea of agriculture and urban lands. So it's, it's um, a place that's really important to me, but it's also kind of a rare place. I'm gonna do so through the lens of the VWA mission. Um, and so the mission of the Ventana Wilderness Alliance is to protect, preserve and restore the wilderness qualities and biodiversity of public lands in the Santa Lucia Mountains and Big Sur Coast. So let's go through that and I'll kind of give you my journey um, through that lens. So you see here a group of volunteers and this kind of smiling only happens after you haul about five tons of trash out of a newly designated wilderness unit. So these are some pretty stoked people. Um, so we begin with a pledge to protect. Um, back in the 1990s, an inventory was underway throughout California to um, survey, you know, mostly national forest lands for um, places with wilderness character, uh, rivers deserving higher uh, protection designations. And the VWA really emerged from this effort and started off with a website that was kind of celebrating the Ventana Wilderness and the Silver Peak Wilderness um, and, you know, promoting uh, expansion of those units. And so the World Wide Web was new at the time, and um, I was thrilled to find this website. It had natural history articles, maps, trail conditions. Um, in any case, this inventory went on, and it eventually led to what you see here, the 2002 Big Sur Wilderness and Conservation Act, um, which added over 50,000 acres of new wilderness. It was actually signed by George W. Bush, if you can believe that. Um, so in any case, I was really impressed with the organization and uh, I considered getting more involved. So the uh, VWA mission can, uh, goes on to um, promote preserving wilderness character. And here we can see some volunteers cleaning up a rogue fire pit. Uh, but the org also strives to restore wilderness character, and that's important in such an impacted place. Um, so by the early 2000s, I was volunteering mostly with office tasks, sending out membership swag like t-shirts and stickers, um, writing web content. But I also started joining a lot of restoration projects, like some of the ones that you see here. And... Um, you know, basically we protected a lot of wilderness, but but really on paper, we started to realize that the Forest Service had no staff to, you know, implement new wilderness areas, to, you know, to take care of the lands that we had worked so hard to protect. So we started rolling up our sleeves to do uh, restoration projects, like some of the things you see here, cleaning up backcountry trash, um, literally reclaiming illegal cannabis grow sites. We packed out a lot of um, drip line out of the backcountry. Um, this kind of restoration was really rewarding um, to me. You could see your progress, um, but also gave us a way to kind of plug in and build community. So, okay. So anyway, so far the mission has mentioned protecting, preserving, and restoring wilderness character, wilderness qualities. But likewise, the org um, seeks to protect, preserve, and restore biodiversity in all its forms. Um, up until about 20 years ago, um, I had mostly worked in bookkeeping and tech support jobs. I'd done a little bit of conservation work early in my days, but um, I really wasn't in it. You know, I was doing all kinds of other things. Wilderness was a weekend pursuit. Um, but I was an amateur naturalist, always had an interest in plants and critters. So I um, took out a student loan. I went back to school. I got a degree in ecology and evolutionary biology. So back to the mission. Um, the VWA mission concludes with a sense of place. 
So in between my lectures and exams, I spent every moment I could getting to know that place, that landscape. Um, I volunteered as much as I could. I hiked just about every trail in the Ventana and Silver Peak Wilderness. I learned the plant and animal life, um, but I also learned um, the issues um, and the players that impacted that area. So in 2008, three separate wildfires um, burned through most of the Ventana. Um, it was a catalyzing event in a lot of ways. Um, so my volunteer work at the office suddenly became like a full-time job, managing the website, the email, the phones. Um, it was really demanding. And so uh, I went to the board and the, the board ended up authorizing some funding to pay me for um, part-time work. And I became the first employee that the organization had um, as communications and development director, part-time, but it was something. Um, I had acumen for messaging, bookkeeping, uh, fundraising, um, but mostly I was really just in the right place at the right time. So within a couple of years, I had started securing some grants that were dependable. We had enough money to hire um, uh, an executive director and to our great fortune, um, an experienced ED from a fellow partner group had just moved to the region. He was only gonna be here two years, but we, um, we hired him on, I shadowed him for that entire time. And um, when he departed the coast, um, everybody else stepped back and I was left standing forward. And so I um, took over as executive director. Um, we had spent a lot of that time doing some important work, infrastructure kind of work. You know, we fine tuned agreements with the Los Padres National Forest. We revised our strategic plan um, and we formalized three core wilderness stewardship programs, which is our meat potatoes nowadays. So I'll go through those. Um, of course, you know, we'd had lots of trail crew volunteers for years, but um, we formalized the, the VWA trail crew. We made it official. We earned agency trust by um, developing release forms, group and individual volunteer agreements, detailed accomplishment tracking, which means a lot. Um, but we also built up an endowment at a local community foundation that generated um, annual disbursements that we could use to pay for contract trail crews to do that work that volunteers just couldn't get at. Um, we also um, use that, that uh, endowment to help pay for a staff member who chases down more trail grants. So it was sort of self-perpetuating in that way. So with the improved trail conditions and the rise of social media, um, visitation exploded. I mean, we're between uh, San Francisco and LA, so there's a lot of visitors. Um, so since the Forest Service had basically zero field staff, um, we managed to coax a former uh, backcountry ranger out of retirement and convinced him to train and outfit this cadre of volunteer wilderness rangers um, who, you know, they greet visitors, they clean up trash, they do fire hazard reduction, they teach leave no trace principles, they teach folks to recreate responsibly, such an important program. And I have to say, as with most conservation groups, um, we were concerned about our average age and the lack of diversity in our ranks. To put it bluntly, you go to a VWA event, you look around, the vibe was stale, male, and pale. So we needed to change that. Um, and we started a youth and wilderness program that worked with local schools to provide wilderness experience, outdoor education to elementary, middle school, high school students. Um, but you can see in the lower right corner here, some college students just uh, back from doing some hardcore trail work. And, and it's kind of amazing how much work gets done by really dedicated university students out on spring break. You know, you can, you can get them to do some really productive work and it's very rewarding for them too. So, so here's my advice, and I'll let my uh, hero, Gary Snyder, tell it better than I could. Um, volunteer, and I know I speak from a place of privilege even saying that, not everybody has that opportunity or that time, but if at all possible, um, really find your place, find a place you love, roll up your sleeves, do what you can, volunteer with, a, with an agency or with a group that you admire. Um, it's my experience that um, good things happen when you do that. So thank you. Great. Thank you very much, Mike. So now we're um, going to start our Q&A portion of the session. Um, if you have any questions for any of the speakers, please just um, 
say next in the chat box so that we just have a, a list of folks who have questions. Um, and unfortunately, Leah had to leave a little bit early. So if you have a question for her, I could share um, her email um, with you. But I just want to thank all the speakers again. Um, this was really informative. Thanks. Um, so I'll open it up to questions. Yeah, Stephen, please go for it. Uh, yeah. Um, so thank you everyone for sharing all your all your stories. That was a lot of information, really quick. <laughs> um, but um, a lot of your stories and uh, involve starting out like straight out of college, uh, you know, and in college. Um, and I was wondering if any of you have any advice for a middle aged person doing career transfers. Um, that, uh, you know, is starting off, has some really good opportunities in wilderness, uh, um, worked for the past year for a great organization, about to transfer over to another wonderful organization, um, but, uh, but is still finding some difficulty finding permanent positions uh, or things um, and having trouble transferring skills of 20 years of work, of management, of wilderness education, of outreach and all sorts and interpretive programs and everything. And so basically for, for a middle-aged person who can't necessarily do uh, a summer long internship or has the knees to do trail crews anymore, um, do you have any advice for, for someone like me or? Um... Yeah, go for it, Andrew. Yeah, uh, Stephen, good question. I think um, one entry point might be uh, the volunteer boards that um, that either you know provide oversight to a lot of these um, nonprofits. You know, they there's a lot of skills, administrative, um, networking, partnership, financial oversight that I think someone uh, in the middle of their career might have a lot more experience with. And so either volunteering, um, volunteering on those boards, you know, a lot of times they're after hours meetings as well. I know that can kind of be a pain, uh, especially if you've got kids, but um, it wouldn't infringe on the work hours. And so that may be a play. And then, you know, a lot of those, a lot of those boards are looking for leadership or other, you know, mid to senior level positions at times. And so identifying yourself as a known quantity through that type of of service might be a, a potential entry point. How would I go about finding boards to volunteer on? Yeah, uh, so um, you look at the types of organizations you would wanna work for or that you like their mission or um, you're interested in, um, so, you know, if you're interested in the Appalachian Trail, the Appalachian Trail Conservancy has a board. If you're um, volunteers for Outdoor Colorado have a board. So you just, you just identify um, the organizations that you like their work. And then um, they're, you know, they, they have boards that term out or board members that term out probably every year. So you would reach out to a staff member and, and say, you know, hey, this is me, this is my background. I'm passionate about your work and your mission. Um, I, you know, I'd love to provide service to your board. Can you talk to me about the nomination process? Um, I think the other thing to do early on is to become a member of that organization too. That always helps right out of the gate. Um, but reaching out to the staff of that organization to determine how board members are nominated, um, what, you know, the details of their, of their responsibility and, um, and maybe talking to an existing board member. Uh, at that point would be a good would be a good fit. But the critical part is finding an organization whose mi uh, mission you feel passionate about. 
Yeah, and I just want to add a little bit to that too. I think that's one opportunity. I think another opportunity is just sort of taking a very realistic approach. You know, there are going to be a lot of jobs coming out of the federal agencies here in the next couple of years. Um, so figuring out how to, um, if you aren't already in the federal system, getting in the system, getting, um, understanding the keywords, you know, there are also, I'm not sure how old you are or what you consider middle age, but <laughs> believe it or not, a lot of young apprentice professional training um, opportunities or uh, like, uh, like I'm thinking of the national trail system, we have an apprentice program that's for anybody between the ages of 18 and 35. So it's young professionals, in some cases, mid-level professionals, depending on where you sit in that schema. Um, but I would also say that there's going to be, oh, okay, so you're 43. <laughs> Okay, so maybe that won't work, but there are a lot of those kinds of opportunities. I, you know, it's just going to be a hustle, but I, I can tell you that especially with the Biden administration and the transitions that's happening right now in our federal agencies where they, they, they kind of shrunk down and they're going to be ramping right back up, especially in recreation. I mean, I definitely, it's going to be a lot. Of, it's, there's no lie that it's not going to be a slug. It's going to be a, a lot of hard work to get in that pike, but that's one opportunity. Um, and I also think there's going to be a lot of um, opportunities as we see the Great American Outdoors Act, some of the partnerships that might come out of that with some of the, the stewardship organizations. I know we'll be hiring technical advisors hopefully in the next year or two. Um, you know, but also don't, you know, like I was, a, I taught swimming and I was a swim, I was a lifeguard, a swim coach and a bread baker for two years. Um, and sometimes you kind of have to go off course to come back on course. So, um, you know, just take a deep breath and, and don't give up, as I guess the other thing I would say is just keep, keep trying at it. There's going to be a lot of opportunities coming in the future. And also use your networks. I hate to say it. Use your networks and, and um, you know, position yourself to be ready to, uh, you know, find those opportunities when they come across your desk. Great. Thanks, Andrew and Teresa. Um, we have another question from Maria. Maria, do you want to share your question? Sure. Hi, everyone. Thanks so much um, for all of the great information you shared with us. Um, my question is directed at Matthew, but if anyone else wants to chime in, I'd be interested to hear what you have to say. Um, so just some quick background for me. I'm a, a graduate student in botany, um, and my interest in wilderness is because I study this area that has wilderness characteristic, um, but it's being threatened by mining. It's adjacent to Death Valley National Park. And so I've become really interested in the aspects of wilderness along the lines of supplemental values, um, because this is a really important plant place. Um, and so through this work, I've gotten more interested in, um, you know, my original plan was to work for a federal agency as a botanist, um, but I really resonated with what you said, Matthew, about um, working for the feds isn't always the best way to, to further conservation. <laughs> and um, Mike, yes, Conglomerate Mesa, um, doing a floor out there. Um, but I, I was wondering if you could elaborate on that. And I'd be curious to hear other people's experience because I'm about to graduate and, and I'm not sure which direction I want to go. Thanks. Well, well, I should preface that knowing that um, a lot of folks in this community come from federal agencies. Um, th this was, you know, I was a 22 year old buried in a sub agency of the EPA after eight years of administration, which had systematically dismantled the EPA. So, so I think that there were a lot of things at play there um, that weren't necessarily um, just because of who the EPA was, right? I think I had many friends who worked at the EPA during the Obama administration. It was an exciting, vibrant place, um, things that were happening. But I think, you know, my passions were also um, more in the public land space, right? So EPA probably was not the agency for me. Um, but I think that there is, I have sort of found my calling in the advocacy space more than the agency space, right? And, uh, and I think that it's, it's, a, it's a personality, it's a, just sort of the experiences I've had. Um, I, I think that there are so many opportunities out there. Um, and like right now we are in a moment a political opportunity that we haven't had in a decade and might never have again. Um, and so, you know, me personally, I'm the type of person who wants to be able to add new designations and keep building the system bigger and bigger when we have those chances. Um, and so that's sort of what has drawn me to, to the advocacy side of things as opposed to maybe more of the stewardship side of things personally. Um, but I'm sure many people on this call have a, have a 
much different experience with with federal work than I did for one year as a 22 year old. So anyone should feel free to to say how wonderful it is to work at a federal agency. I, I don't know if I can say that. I actually went the exact opposite direction as I just, I'm laughing at myself telling, um, I think it was uh, whoever asked the question before that, yeah, look for federal jobs. It's a great door in our uh, way in. I spent six months as a backcountry ranger and I realized I couldn't wear the green suit. I couldn't walk the walk and talk the talk and I needed more, I needed more flexibility. Um, and I think for some people, you know, I remember having this conversation with my dad. He was like, you're crazy. You're going to give up on all these other benefits, which there are a ton of benefits that come with federal positions. And I can tell you in the work that we do, Andrew can probably speak to this too. We work with some of the most innovative, creative professionals in federal agencies, at least in the national child system. So it's not impossible to be creative and innovative and all of those things, if, depending on who you are as a human being and how you can negotiate sort of that, that framework. I cannot. <laughs> <laughs> I, I'm just too crazy pants. I'm just, I just can't stay straight. And so I found it to be a challenge. And I, I think also at the time I was entering into the career world, it was just a different world for me. And I, I found at ATC, um, I was recognized for my skills and not boxes that I was checking. And so for me, that was kind of really important. I had privilege to be able to do that. But um, I would just say like, don't, there, there's great opportunities there. Um, no, and this goes back to maybe Anne's point around emotional intelligence and understanding who you are and where you're going to thrive and how you can thrive. And there are definitely ways to thrive within the federal agencies. Um, there's also a lot of challenges. And then with the nonprofit world, there's a lot of challenges in the nonprofit world. I'll tell you, if, if organizations aren't work, work, uh, managed well, you know, you don't get paid the same amount of money. You may not have all the same benefits. You know, there's other benefits, but you know, there's, about, there's pros and cons to either way. And I think you have to understand who you are and where you're going to thrive and how you're going to create a support system that will allow you to thrive in whichever direction you go. Um, so I don't think there's a wrong answer. And also, you know, even if you were to take a job for six months, nothing says you can't go on to something else after that. So it's, you know, none of these decisions are life permanent decisions, whether by your choice or somebody else's. So just as you go into careers, know that, I mean, like I said, I never planned to be unemployed. <laughs> and there we were. Um, never have, you know, you just don't, you don't know what the world's going to present. So, you know, don't look at an opportunity as like, this is the only thing I can do. It's only just one step in a long, long time, you know, a long span of professional opportunities. Great. Thank you, Maria, for your question. Um, we have another question from Steve. Uh, do you want to share? Yeah. So can everybody hear me? Thanks for uh, thanks for sharing everything. It was very interesting. Uh, I'm sort of piggybacking on the, the first question from Stephen. I'm a little bit older than him. I'm 56. Uh, but this question really isn't about just about me, I, but I'll tell you about my situation. So I'm, um, I'm looking at retirement in my future, and I definitely want to spend my retirement years helping out with the environment. I already volunteer when I can um, and take time out of my work to do that. Uh, and when I'm retired, I can do more of that. Um, however, it would also be nice to have part-time work. Um, and so my broader question uh, on an organizational level to understand the organizations involved here is um, in when I have volunteered and when I've contacted different organizations, I'm often surprised at the level of how underfunded, what it seems to me underfunded they are, both in their volunteer areas and also in moving some of those volunteer areas into uh, lower paying or part-time positions. And I know like Mike uh, talked about that a little bit when he was getting started that he actually had to go ask and say, I'm a volunteer, but I'm being overworked. Can you make, give me some money, you know? Um, and so I'm wondering from an organizational perspective, where that divide is, I feel like, especially where the economy is right now, we have a lot of middle-class people who have skills and who are interested in getting involved in this kind of work, uh, but there just seems to be not even, uh, you know, not very easy ways to get even smaller, smaller amounts of pay. Um, and there's an additional problem is if, if this work also has to do with, um, uh, wilderness work, 
a lot of those wilderness areas uh, are can be removed or people will have to move residents and then finding housing can be another problem as well as they move. So um, from an organi organizational perspective, I'm wondering, um, are there, what are the blocks to that? And are there ways, are there some organizations, some nonprofits that are trying to do something about that, maybe to raise funds so that volunteers can be provided for different wilderness areas, et cetera? I'll, I'll take, I'll take a crack at that, Steve, since, um, you know, my, my work has actually been a lot in um, organizational sustainability and capacity. And, um, you know, nonprofits, just the way they're set up. Um, you know, in, in our case, Volunteers Voucher Colorado has been around for 37 years. We have a zero-based budget, which means you, you balance your expenses with the revenue you bring in. We raise $1.5 million every year in the year we spend it. So if you think about that, it's not like there's, you know, this tax base that's funding us or this, you know, you know that. I mean, everybody knows that on the call, so it's not rocket science. But that's just an inherent challenge in charitable work and nonprofit work that especially when you add the component of volunteerism, often the public, including donors, have to be educated that volunteerism isn't free. And so running a well-managed organization, I'm sure Mike saw this and, and all of us have seen this when we deal with volunteers, is that in order to have retained volunteers in order to run good programs, you actually have to run actually a business. And you know, my acumen is in business and in business management. I will tell you that my experience over the 40 years I've been in is if your organization isn't sitting at about 1.5 million, it's hard to do any kind of capacity. Building. It just is impossible. And so to move a volunteer into paid work or whatever, you know, yeah, maybe you could get a donor. Is it sustained money? I don't know. And so when we bring on positions, we try to think about the sustainability of that position so that you can actually provide a livelihood, whether it's half time or full time, to a person. I mean, you know, you don't want to say, well, we ran out of money. Sorry, we have like six months of money for you, but sorry, we're done. Right. And so it's, you know, I think um, in my case, in Volunteers Dr. Colorado, when I came here 14 years ago, we had a highly professionalized volunteer organization. Volunteers did everything. The challenge on the other side of that is that the volunteer might go away or the volunteer has knee surgery or you know whatever it is, right? And you don't have that person. And so I have spent the last 14 years building a leadership bench and jobs. So we've actually increased jobs in the organization. But I would just say it's not, um, you know, I think I really liked your story, Mike, around, you know, really being involved in Ventura there, I mean, at the level you were. And I would say to you, Steve, you know, moving out of retirement, if you have any flexibility to get engaged first and that movement happens as it did in Mike's case, um, you know, I think there is a lot of potential for that. And organizations like ours do recognize that, that, hey, we've got, like we have right now a a way in which some of our volunteer leaders are now what we call our Outdoor Stewardship Institute instructors. They do training and we pay them for that now. We used to not pay, but we pay them and we can track that. So again, I think there are ways, but it's it's just not linear and it's not, you know, we should just try to have volunteers get paid. It, it it's, um, unfortunately doesn't work quite that simply in my experience. Yeah, to, to follow up yeah, on that. Um, I'll just, um, oh, sorry, go ahead, go ahead. I was just gonna say, you know, I think there's this other slight weird component too in that systemically, you know, and I get it, like at ATC it was like, you know, we, we try to work ourselves out of a job. We were always trying to elevate volunteers, but I think there's this, you know, and hit on it, that there's this flip in how we're looking at nonprofits today where we really have to be businesses. I, you know, one of the things we talk with CDTC about is, we may be nonprofit, but we make money. Like we're not, it's not a bad word to say we are, 
you know, we're generating revenue. It's just is for mission. And, you know, but at the same time, we want to have, you know, invest in our people so that, you know, I heard you say like, you know, why can't we have low paying jobs or part-time jobs? That isn't a livable, if it isn't a livable wage, then you're not creating an equitable system for the people that are in that system. And then you're not attracting a more diverse workforce because you have to be doing that. And I get the mentality of like nonprofits, you know, we're nonprofit. We're, we're not a nonprofit. That's, I hate that term. We are a business that works towards mission. And in order for us to be sustainable, we need to make a profit. We just didn't reinvest that profit. And so as we sort of lift our ships up, we're lifting everybody up. So yeah, I could get paid more, but I'll get paid more when all of our staff are equally getting paid more. And there's a there's an equity in that system as much as there's an equity in in how we we approach volunteers. You know, we were just talking about we're bringing on some interns, and we decided not to call them interns even because of the the, the connotation that what an intern refers to. So we're calling them students or we're calling them young professionals or we're, we're figuring out that terminology because in that systemic space, that kind of terminology is, is you know, it's, it's just, it's a difficult terminology and we need to be pushing towards a different way of looking at um, the organizations that support this type of work and how we can function um, sort of in a more professional level. Because I think sometimes people also view nonprofits as not professional. You know, and I think we are highly professional, highly motivated and highly talented, regardless of your age profile or anything, you know, and it's just and to Anne's point, you know, it's just to be sustainable in order for people to, to stay with us long term, we have to invest in our people and ensure that they can, they don't have to struggle. They're not worrying. Am I going to get paid? Am I going to be laid off? Am I going to be when there's a pandemic? Am I going to get am I going to lose my job? You know, because that affects how much work and how much deliverable we get. And so it's always, there's this balancing system. And, and I think for most of us on this call, you know, I started out as a volunteer. So I get that. Comple I mean, that is my roots. So as I think about being an executive director and managing those things, I'm always thinking about that, that balance point of investing and also recognizing we're of service. We want to create these opportunities. It is a community, but also make it, not taking advantage of people because it is of service and we're doing it from our heart. So it's a balance point. Um, it's not the best answer, but just maybe pra pragmatic one. <laughs> yeah, I was just gonna say that, um, kind of reiterating the point I'd made already that, um, you know, showing up is half the battle. And, and like, um, like Andrew had said, you know, if you do have time to, to volunteer on a board with an org that you admire, um, I'm very place-based, you know, if, it, if, it, if they're fighting for a place that you love, um, you know, more power to you if you can do it. And in my experience, the folks who've come on and have the passion and they'll join the board or they'll volunteer, it, you know, if they want to move further with the org and, and we can find a way to do it. I've literally told people, these are some p potential grant makers who might fund a job for you. Go go get the money. And And some of them have, and they end up moving up in the org and you know, I think everybody we have now is full time and two of them I can think of started part time with that very model. So it's possible. Thanks for all those comments. I think I, I, I just have one comment from my experiences. So I'm in Wisconsin and uh, there's some uh, nonprofit uh, land trusts here. And um, I know one fairly closely. I won't name it, but <laughs> um, and my the one of the difficulties I see with this dilemma is that uh, if it can, let me, let me put it this way, it's a more positive way of putting it. If it can be done, if an organization is taking in a substantial amount of money every year, um, either through uh, just donations or through grants, um, and they can sustain a, a fairly permanent workforce or at least at least a volunteer pro a good volunteer program, but even more so of a, a workforce. If that can be sustained over time, those people who are volunteering there and working there are part of the community, who then uh, can really Im impress other members of the community that this is a good thing that we're doing, and that leads to getting more donations in the future and more grants in the future because you have more of the community behind you because you have volunteers and because you have people who work for you and spend more time there. And so to me, if you can sustain that financially, I think it really 
improves the situation in the long term. But it's I understand that you have to do it over time. That it can't just be one year or whatever. It has to be continue consistent. So, and thank you for all your answers. Yeah, thanks, thanks, Steve, for your question, and and thanks everyone for the answers. Um, yeah, I want to get to Kat's question before we run out of time. Uh, Kat. Hey, Jacob, it's great to see you all. And thank you so much for all of the presentations. Um, it's invaluable to me personally, I know to everybody on this call. Um, so my name is Kat Lyons, um, and I actually previously held Jacob's position at SWS. So I'm really happy to see SWS growing um, and this community doing so well um, and to have all these great presenters. Um, so I actually left SWS to get a master's at the Duke Nicholas School. Uh, master's in environmental management um, with a, con a concentration in landscape conservation. And my master's project focused on working better with indigenous populations across the US. Um, so I'm really interested in this space, um, but kind of to Andrew's point, how do I pitch this idea? How do I chase it? How do I um, kind of make sure that people um, hear a position that I potentially want to push forward because I see it as the time and the space to do it. And I want to know how to attract, how to better attract, you know, a nonprofit to the idea. How do I get my own funds to support that? What makes it more attractive for a nonprofit to take me on to push a position? Like something like that, or, you know, you know, how does, how does that make it more attractive? Um, and Andrew, you can speak to it, but anybody, if you have of insight? Sure. So the, the question was specific to um, building partnerships with Native nations and Indigenous communities. The yeah, but in general, like pitching ideas to nonprofits be like, hey, I see this space. I want to do it. How do I do it with you? Sure. Well, the in that particular case, I think the, the one of the first places to start would be, you know, with those Native nations, with tribal governments, with Native communities and talking to them about the relationships that they they already have with public land managers um, or nonprofits or or the places that they would like to have relationships and don't and I think that in in within those conversations you might see the space for opportunity um, to go forward but you know talking more broadly about how to how to identify um, identify you know places where you could create your own job opportunity. I think, it, you know, it's one, it's a lot of um, pounding the pavement, so to speak. And it's a lot of, you know, ad hoc kind of network um, building. But also I think what you'll find is that you're not the only person who has this idea. And a lot of times the people who are either in these public land management um, positions in your case, you know, work with Native Nations, they're, they're probably also thinking from, a, you know, another point of view, wow, I wish I had a person who could help coordinate these relationships with these public land managers. And if in doing so, you know, opens up a ton of opportunities for all of us. And so when you find those people who share your perspective on need out there, I think at that point, really being flexible to learn what from them, you know, the conservation landscape that they are seeing and, and they're creating need. And then, you know, working collaborat collaboratively to identify wh whether it's, um, you know, short-term grant programs that you guys can work together on or um, foundation work or, or, or things like that. But really, once you can kind of find a, either a champion or a partner who's, who's embedded in that landscape somewhere, and shares your perspective that there's a need, then really working collaboratively, collaboratively and also being flexible um, to create that to create that workspace because it's not going to be exactly perf exactly what you think. This is actually going to be a, a really good learning opportunity as you as you do pound that pavement to kind of see okay my idea is this, but but what I'm learning now is that the conservation landscapes you know might need something more like this. And so blending those two together, it's almost your own kind of strate your personal strategic development um, it is really important responding to the feedback you get as you talk to people about, hey, is this a need? Am I seeing this correctly? And if so, um, 
you know, how, uh, how can I apply it? I remember early in my career, um, I was, um, after one of the many times ATC has rejected me, I was trying to go um, and do, uh, and work in Western North Carolina. Um, and I contacted, uh, you know, I needed a job, right? Cause I wasn't gonna get one with ATC. I just mentioned that again. Um, and so the, the, the guy on the phone said, you know, I said, what kind of experience do I need? And he said, you know, you, you need not only getting a grant, but also applying that, doing the financial tracking, doing the reporting. That's what we see is like, is like it's not only getting the grant, but it's also working to apply the grant and reporting back. So I said, okay, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to latch on to some people closer to me who are working on implementation of their grant. Um, I can get that experience that I can go back. And, um, and be more useful, more valuable in, in future, um, uh, you know, job searches. So just being responsive, like keeping your idea at a core, but being responsive to what you learn in the conservation landscape as you, as you pound the pavement. Can, can, I, can, I, can I also just add briefly, Kat? Um, I would say, I, I think you, you, you said it, um, but now is the moment for your skill set, and that's 100% true. Um, in, within the conservation advocacy space, I don't know one organization that is not like desperate for that type of skill set right now. And, and I think that it has been a blind spot for the conservation community for so long, for decades. And very quickly now, people are trying to catch up. Um, and the administration's already out ahead of us with their new 30 by 30 initiative and with Secretary of Interior Deb Holland. And they're going to be looking for indigenous led conservation proposals as one of their top priorities for the next three and a half to four years. So, so I would just say now is your moment. So, so don't give up, pound that pavement because there will be an opportunity. Thank you. And I, and I was just gonna add to that cat that, um, you know, like Andrew, sometimes the third time's the charm. Um, so don't give up just because you get a rejection. Um, and the second thing I would say is if you're interested in organizations, look at their strategic plan. Like I know for CDTC, we guide by that strategic plan. So if you see alignments already, and, and you might even ask, you know, I don't know anybody in my field, especially that would not say, hey, if you reached out to me and said, hey, I'd love to you know, bend your ear and ask some questions about career stuff, I would definitely say yes. And we could talk about the strategic plan and we could have a conversation around what gaps are we needing in terms of capacity to accomplish whatever's in that plan and how can we do that together? If it's outside of that plan, it's not necessarily a no, it's more like how can it be tied to that? Because I, I am a very much, you know, we have to, we, you know, in order to operate like a business, you have to operate to your plans because you have budgets and all these long-term things that you're attached to those. But it's also an opportunity to, to vet a creativity space, right? So if you can be creative in that space and innovative, that's the other thing that we're all looking for is thinking out of the box and not doing things traditionally. And so now this is it, this is your time. If you're uh, not worried about the you know the traditional way of doing things, this is a great time to be in the field. So, thank you so much for the encouragement. Um, I really appreciate it, and I'm excited to you know push forward because I think you guys are very inspiring and it's helpful to see the trajectory um, that everyone's been through. So thank you so much. Thanks, Kat, for your question. Um, and thank you all uh, for joining. Um, we're coming to the end of our time here. So I just wanna thank the speakers. This was uh, really great. Um, a couple other things. In 30 minutes, Heather's gonna be leading a workshop on uh, nonprofit career uh, hiring. Um, and that's gonna be an hour long conversation. And this is, that's gonna use the same Zoom link uh, that we're on now. Um, and one other thing, um, there's a couple one-on-one -on -one slots that are still open if anyone's interested. Um, Andrew Downs has one slot open this afternoon at 1.15 p.m. Mountain Time. And there's two slots open tomorrow with Ann Baker Easley um, at 10 a.m. and 11.45 a.m. If you're interested in signing up for those, just shoot me a message and I could um, put you on the list. Um, thank you again. Thanks so much, you guys.